Happy birthday to me. All right, it's 11.59 on this, the 28th of June. And that means there are now fewer than 60 seconds left in my birthday. In fact, there are fewer than 10. So as I say goodbye to June 28th and say hello to June 29th, happy birthday, Jake. Well, what can I say? It's been a phenomenal week. I mean, oh my God. And tonight was the most mellow of all, which is good because tomorrow's a dance party that I'm going to. So I didn't need to get out of control tonight. Plus I got to be at work at seven in the morning. And so in seven hours, I will be uh, slaving to the man, as we like to say here in America, when we talk about putting in our effort for somebody else's reward. But I'm not here to talk about that. And of course, I understand that my own reward in seeking out employment and the returns of money that come with it to let me buy asparagus is something that I'm not taking into account when I speak of other people's reward. But you know what I'm saying. And uh, I couldn't spend even a minute of my birthday fucking dealing with what's got to be dealt with. Now that it's the 29th, now that I'm 55 years old, now that I'm 364 days away from having another birthday, that gives us plenty of time to hash out the, I guess, the fall of civilization. I don't even know what we're experiencing here in America. But what's happened is we have cored out our accountability and uh, moral sense of purpose and uh, again, we've done this for something called money and something called power and something called sex. But we all knew that part. And we all knew the other two parts, too. I'm just said it. That's the three headed beast that we fight here in America. Basically, you can get us to do anything. If you'll give us enough money, let us fuck the hottest chick in the room. Oh, and we get to order whatever we want from the kitchen. We have that kind of power. Oh, my God, this is going to be great. Oh, I like politics. Um, yeah, said, well, quite a few of the politicians, unfortunately. Not all of them, not all of them. And in fact, thanks to the catastrophe that was Thursday night's uh, debate between our two anointed, not elected, not democratically uh, escalated through a system of fair checks and balances against other candidates. Nope, they were just plopped on the fucking ballot and said, that's who you'll vote for, him or him. And we said, what? And they said, yeah. And we said, what? And they said, fuck you. And we said, what? Ha! Huh. Did that, did they really say fuck you? Sounded like it. Anyway, so once they told us to fuck off that this would be the race, well, we thought, fantastic. This is what apathy looks like. I just don't even care enough of a shit to get involved in what is clearly a farcical situation from the get-go. Add in the contamination of the voting machines, and, well, you can imagine that I had a lot better things to do this week than deal with this shit. But now that it's here, now that it has to be dealt with, of course... I guess that's what we got on to talk about. I mean, I got some fun shit, too. Fuck, I've had a great week. And, I, and tomorrow's going to be even better. And Sunday might be my best day of all. Just because things are starting to fall into place on something that it, it's kind of hot and new. But my point being, if you're going to go out in your community, give it two or three months. Just go out regularly into the community. Join the Pilates studio. Go to the yodeling class that's offered at the community center. Take swimming lessons at the rec center. Go to sit at a coffee shop and actually have conversations. Do these types of things to get to know the people who both live in your community and choose to visit it because they like it. And the more of these people you get to know, the more you'll understand how much, uh, what, uh, the undercurrent of support that people are here to provide is just untapped. The problem is nobody really knows how to step outside the isolation bubbles and do good for the community. 
but they all want to do that. They're all trying to find the right app that'll allow them to do that. But instead of just putting their fucking phone down, going into the community and having conversations, which is where it all starts and where it all is uncovered, both in your own potential in your community and your community's potential to support you. These are wonderful things to have working in your favor. And all it takes is just the confidence that you deserve it. Pause. Um, pause. All right. So because I'm basically taking the month of June off from all this recording stuff, uh, I have um, little nuggets of, uh, of note that I would uh, hope to maybe get two or three of into this recording, since I probably have 30 of them. Um, and I wrote three of them down, so you'd think I'd be able to read what I wrote here, or at least remember I wrote something down that I wanted to talk about. But that's asking a lot, especially because I've basically been having a birthday for three and a half days. So at this point, I am spent, really spent. Um, but my friend Jake, his birthday's today, now the 29th. And I feel like I should walk over to the establishment in which he's employed, say hello, do the official birthday, uh, uh, what's the baton transfer, I suppose, from track and field, from mine to his, as um, he now celebrates the midnight toll of, holy shit, man, you don't even look 34. I mean, fuck, maybe 33, but not 34. Um, yeah, yeah. I got a lot of, uh, I did not get anybody who tried to guess my age within more than, the closest someone got was four years. And most people were off by eight to 10, which felt good, at least for somebody who started getting gray hair at 15. Um, I've been blessed in every other capacity to still look young. I'll admit my hair is falling out and mostly gray, but if I shave my head, I can pass for 40 um, as long as I'm hanging out with a bunch of 40 year olds. But the point about age to me, and I was actually discussing this with my sister today, is you never feel an age. There is no such thing. You never feel 15. You never feel 40. You never feel 38. You never feel seven. You just are you accumulating this body of memory and activity uh, um, past that you then use along with all of the real-time data and future prediction modeling you want to undertake to do the next best thing for yourself in the capacity that fulfills your life and protects it from being vanquished. I mean, that's super stupidly simple, but in all of that, as you get older, you will never feel old. You will never feel anything but yourself. Now, you may see markers of society that give you reference points that make you feel old. Wait, how old is that movie? 35 years? Okay, that feels like it came out two weeks ago. Or maybe 10 years ago. But 35 fucking A. You start to have those moments quite a bit. Because there is a collapse of your sack of, what, memory treasure that you're carrying around. I don't know how much of that you actively are engaging at any given time. For instance, I can't name all the henchmen in Die Hard. But I'll bet if we start that movie... And especially I see the first scene where they pull the truck in and the dude cuts up, uh, the phone lines. Cut the phone lines first? Yeah, they cut the power last. So if I saw that scene and if Argyle's partying with Bruce Willis over in the in the limo, uh, I would probably be able to remember Hans and Franz or whatever their names are. I know that's what uh, the two twins are, but I don't know anybody else in the crew. And yet, Bruce Willis writes their names down across the course of the movie. I think every single one of their names. Um, <clears throat> but, that said, why the fuck am I talking about Die Hard? Because I still will sit down and watch Die Hard. After 
seeing Die Hard my junior year of college. So I was 20 years old when I first saw Die Hard. I'm now 55. There's your 35-year gap, baby. Die Hard's in its 35th anniversary, if I had to guess, and I would sit down and watch it right now. I would not watch two, and I'd kind of watch three, maybe, depending on how late we're going to stay up, that kind of thing. But I'm in for one anytime. I'd say Die Hard is actually in my top 30 favorite movies of all time, which is shocking considering it's a stupid terrorist movie about a building and Bruce Willis. But let's face it, Hans Gruber steals the show. Um, and in so doing, turns it into one fun movie to watch. Plus, they really nailed the action in that movie. Although it is a lot dated with the roof helicopter scene specifically. But what are you going to do? You get old, shit looks fucking crappier from your childhood because shit gets better. It's how life works. It's another way that you can feel old. You can feel like the things of your youth that were innovative well, as they move into not so interesting and all the way to passe, then you start to feel anachronistic. You start to think, I'm a relic in a world full of innovation. I'm a memory of another time of life that no longer exists. I'm something of both the past and the future trying to manifest as best as possible right here in the current. And... <clears throat> when your past is as great as your future, or when your past gets greater than your future, then a lot of what you really will do is settle your past. Meaning, there's only so much you even want to drag around. There's only so much that's worth having at your disposal. There's only, in terms of life accumulation... There's only so much of that you really want in your knapsack. Most of what you want is the flexibility and dexterity to move forward and to do so with whatever experience has learned you, the things that you pick up in life, the things that you come to understand about yourself, the things that you really feel you have seen enough of the cycle to believe not only the cycle exists, but that it is, in fact, cycling through in a way that you recognize. When you find these ways of social movement, social uh, progression, cultural co coalitions, the, the gathering of consensus into new modes of thought and living, the emergence of technological innovation that changes the face of reality as you know it. All these, all these um, accumulations is the best word I have for it, and I'll come up with something better. But all these ways of being able to reflect back into what you used to be, they have very limited value. They are obviously the collective amalgamation of who you are, so they have extraordinary value to you but they're gone they're done they are either something you moved through for and grew from and learned or they are something that you went through and missed out on lessons potentially there to be achieved or there's something you went through and suffered chaos or some level of 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 horror that has set you back and <clears throat> Having been, again, the universe's most fortunate son, that nothing rings in that horror column for me. Um, I don't really like to speak to that trauma because while I know it exists and I know it's serious enough to be uh, a candidate among all of our mental woes is the unnecessary abuse of anyone at the hands of another well, again, I recognize that issue. I'm here to help heal, but I have no experience to speak to it, so I don't. But what I do speak to is being the kid who, when he falls out of a bag of cotton candy, he lands in a bowl full of pudding so he can tumble into another whipped cream hot tub. I just seem to have always 
lived a life of somewhat buoyant support. And I've always thought that it was coming from an upswell of energy to which I'm uniquely able to tune into as necessary because I clearly <laughs> spent plenty of time tuning a different, uh, a different harmony. So what today and having to me, the only day that I really reflect on what the fuck I'm doing with my life is my birthday. And I don't do it every year by any means, but I've really, <laughs> I've changed so much that I feel like if I don't annually check in with where I'm grounded, what my foundation is now, what my year, if tackled with the sort of vigor, I feel I owe the universe at this point. It's not like anything that I'm envisioning for myself. I don't see myself 110% committed to. Like I won't be dabbling in say, um, magic, the card game. That is not on my list of shit to do. So what I will dabble in is finding the people. And this week has just sent them as if in some sort of <laughs> fictional form, just the, the self-loathing elements of people's lives have been on display readily for me to support. And I do not seek these energies out. I do not want to contribute my empathy in places where it hasn't fostered itself naturally. And all of these situations found me. And two of them, I'm glad did. And one of them, I, I'm not surprised. And then a couple others just came out of the blue with random connections who are now becoming a lot more um, trusted. There's just, there's an energy in the air for me right now that I know who to trust. And as soon as I realize you're on the list, the trust is in, it's entire. Like I just, my, my level of exposure to the universe is a hundred percent right now. Like there's nothing I'm hiding or feel underhanded about, or would even think that I shouldn't be live streaming to the, well, I mean, we're not going to live stream me in the shower, but if we live streamed my activity in the community, I'd be a hundred percent for it, but I do need to go see what that sound was. Cause I hope that's not a sound of a mouse or an animal, but I think it was pause. <sighs> Unpause. Well, it wasn't a squirrel. I don't think anyway, who gives a shit point is I've been rambling on like an old person about getting old, which makes me feel a little Biden-y, but instead of making fun of our president for being too old for the job, which he clearly is instead, what I want to do is I want to let everyone know who might be uh, in their teens or in their mid twenties, or even maybe they just hit 30 or somehow now they're 45 or they're even seven. The best part about all those ages is you will always be you. You will not be the 44 year old version of you, nor the seven year old version of you. You will be the in the now complete and growing better version of yourself that can see obviously all the progress made, but is in no way locked into an identity that age represents. And I don't know that I've lived on enough lives of this type of aging that happens rapidly like it does here on earth. Every life form, I think in the more um, expansive universe sees much greater spans of living than 60 to 80, 100 years or 10. I mean, everywhere there's tragedy, so 10 is possible, but 60 is, 60 is young. 60 is really young. So here at 55, <clears throat> well, all I can say is I still feel young, really young, and I act fucking immature. So when you put it all together, 
Like I said, I think I'm a 14-year-old. Pause. Non-presidential on ball. All right, I had to do that one at least once. Because you know who does not look 14? Mr. Joe Biden. No. Not unless we were talking about 14 years too old to be doing anything that would be considered of world consequence. That man, well, obviously I've entertained the idea that he's a clone because look at him, right? He could be, or a fucking robot that the CIA built. It's possible, let's be honest. But given that that's only like one minuscule possible percent out of a trillion, but it's still possible, um, we'll just have to assume that this is, in fact, the first true case of elder abuse in our politics that I've witnessed. And I don't want to say that you couldn't see this coming. Although if you're my mom and dad, you couldn't see this coming. But their generation, their 80-year-old selves, are exactly Biden's uh, peers. So they have all of the uh, recognition of their own capabilities and understand that ageism is not just uh, something that should limit individuals by a number, but should be uh, reserved for actually seeing people failing and needing to be pulled off the line for having gotten too old to do something. Until I can prove to you that I am incompetent, well then allow me to continue being competent for as long as I can persist in my human meat suit. And if that's 107 years, and I'm still agile, alert, and able, well then, let me run for president. But if you're 81, what is going on? Hang on, pause. Okay, I'm paused. It's just something wicked this way comes. It is blustery out there. I mean, the trees are literally talking. There was this synchronized wind patterning that was occurring as the amount of wind was being sent through the leafiest of the big trees that made it sound like chatter. As if somehow, if you just knew tree... Well, you'd probably be eavesdropping on a pretty fucking cool conversation. But that's got you thinking, fuck, man, you did mushrooms again? And I'm saying, no, I didn't. But the trees are talking. And they really talk to you when you're on mushrooms. But if you just listen to the universe, it's talking to you all the time. So I don't feel bad talking back to the universe and asking the universe, hey, universe, I'm wondering uh, if now is a good time for you to admit that you were not born in a Big Bang. You think that that uh, that whole sort of idea from that Jesuit priest or whoever it was at the Vatican that thought, yeah, that's how it all happened. Well, turns out he was wrong. And um, and of course, universe. I don't expect you to tell us when you were born. That's still a mystery that we've got to crack or how you were born, or why we're here, or why you're here, or why any of this exists. We're still working on that. So I'm not asking for the inside dirt, but I do like when our methods of observation, the data points that we can now gather, the uh, way with which we can see the universe in a way that we've never seen it before, thanks to the James Webb Telescope. Well, it's essentially breaking the time line of necessity for the universe to have formed as we have predicted it has come together um, by showing us things that in our model simply can't exist like galactic structures that are light years and billions of of suns and and light sources more intense than anything that should be seen at that depth of vision. So our story isn't right. That doesn't necessarily make it all wrong. We've got quite a few predictive elements inside the Big Bang that have some validity. Um, 
particularly when you look at the numbers for hydrogen and helium. But that's kind of the linchpin, the flag in the ground, as it were, that became the foundational stone on which the Big Bang was built. The problem is that when you go looking for lithium, well, then your foundation starts to immediately crumble. And I know it does feel good to think, yeah, but we got hydrogen and helium, right? That's like two-thirds of the fucking equation. So can't we just stick around for a while and pretend we're the shit? Okay, okay, Big Bang. Yes, you can do that for, let's say, 35, 40 years, maybe even 100. But your limited shelf life, because we can't help but get better data, the more data collecting we learn to do. And we're in that position now when it comes to at least looking out into the stars above. We are now seeing paradigm-breaking entities that make us think, okay, well, whoa, what the fuck? And physics is asking that question all over the place, not just at the cosmic scale, but even at the microcosmic scale. And so this level of uncertainty, this level of discovering something new that makes us understand something we thought we understood stood already better and thus creates innovative avenues of thought that take us on directions we hadn't even headed yet. This is all the accumulation of a wiser society building its knowledge base through experience and innovation. So nothing to see here. However, when that spirit of discovery and uh, individual achievement and collective enhancement and advancement gets derailed. Well, usually it gets derailed because people want to take a bit of uh, what success has been uh, fostered and call it their own, uh, put it in a honeypot and uh, go only let other bears uh, that they like eat that honeypot with them like everybody in Washington. But it's not... Oh, pause. Oh, um, pause. It's not... It's not something that, as us humans interact, as we are um, beholden to a set of ideas that then shape our view of the universe, as, as we start to accommodate this knowledge of both society and civilizations from your... Well, one of the things we do is we start to think that we know shit. Okay, we know that. We know the Big Bang is is how it happened. When we've never known that. And, in fact, it's had problems even from the first concept of its origination. And we have used every trick in the physics book to keep that motherfucker alive, whether it's dark energy or dark matter or inflation or misrepresenting what's moving around what, or creating some sort of vortex of travel through the galaxy that is not perceived. I don't know. There's all kinds of shit that you got to deal with if you want the Big Bang model to work that are basically band-aids on one hemorrhaging wound. And this is kind of history as we know it. It takes an extraordinary amount of of momentum to move anything with a kind of entrenched inertia that academic disciplines have. You are not going to unwind the paradigm of Egyptology without coming to the table with the kind of evidence that now exists that their story is horseshit. Even as we can see that, the structure that is our canon of knowledge has to take the hit that is, oh yeah, we had all that wrong. And since, oh, we had all that wrong, is the last thing the human beings really like to do, is to admit that they fucked up. Well, <clears throat> you kind of got to let some people die. You got to get the entrenched into the ground so that the paradigm can shift in a way that the powerful ascension of new concepts and ideas is enabled to flourish. And then, of course, they can become powerful, entrenched, and jaded, and we can go through the cycle all over again. But that's how we do it. That's the best we got. And it's actually pretty motherfucking effective. 
It's just a bit of humility in the face of ideas that may have transient value, but are not truths of the universe. It's okay to come up with something that gets us through the next 40 years in terms of technological uh, innovation, and then for it to absolutely disappear, never to be seen again. That's a whole lot of contribution to the momentum of humanity getting to where it needs to go. So even if your paradigm is shattered in your lifetime, the idea that you contributed to something that moved our framework positively forward is all that matters. And convincing academics of this is next to impossible because they're in a schema of recognition. They're in a schema of, of um, commitment to schools of thought to the point of having to defend them even in delusional realities, such as, say, something like trying to convince the world that what's happening in Gaza isn't genocide. Academics like to take that kind of shit on because it shows off their mental acuity in terms of hoodwinking the masses. But for most of us, the truth, the actual reality of the situation that we're existing within is what matters, not the story that we've committed to and thus are now destined to oversell even in the face of it crumbling around us. I say all this because if ever there was a prelude to what our American politics have become, that's the prelude. Pause. Oh, pause. All right. A lot of life has actually happened in that last pause, uh, unexpectedly. So back on track I'm trying to get, but forgive me if I get uh, a little bit um, uh, sloppy with <clears throat> trying to explain just exactly what the debate shows us. Because the debate is a major uh, pivot moment. And yes, I actually think pivot was the word to use there. So no gratuitous use of pivot, not like every other newscaster in the universe. No, but this is, this is the crack in the veneer that begins to unwind the whole charade. This is the emperor showing up and everyone realizing he's fucking naked and old and senile and losing his marbles and unable to register what's going on in the fucking room, let alone the conversation. So, you know, let's put him on the Democratic ballot for president. Fuck yeah! Love that Biden guy. Pause. On polls. Uh, it's now 6.04 here on the 29th of June. And that would be the PM because I'm about to go dancing, motherfuckers. I cannot wait for this night. This is going to be a blast. Which is why I really wanted to get on here and talk about how there was always one very uncomfortable thought that I carried into my parents' house for the better part of two decades to three decades. Hard to say how much overlap and real window of opportunity to pull these shenanigans I had, but a conversation that I haven't had in my head in a long, 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 long time is, do my parents know I'm on drugs right now? And <clears throat> I know this is a point of small interest, but this is why it's a point of interest. Because I realized tonight that my dad has emerged again in his lighthearted, jovial version. And it's been coming for a year or two, but it is firmly entrenched now. And admittedly, he got knee surgery, which is probably going to put him back on the tennis and golf courses. So there's a lot of uptick in his life right now to make him feel uh, buoyant. But I cannot help but notice that of all the cold cases that I thought I should give up on, my dad's actually made some huge progress. So one of the reasons I think that's the case is because he hasn't had to say, I think my son's on fucking drugs right now. Fucking A. 
in a long time. And I know he never actually said that to my face, but I know he said it in mental thoughts to me like at least a hundred times. Well, not a hundred, but maybe 60. So there are enough of those taints, the residue, the, the pollen that you're secreting into the universe as a tree of bad faith. It just, it is what it is. If you're a person using drugs regularly, when you show up at Thanksgiving on a three-day bender, people will notice, regardless of how little drug use history any of them have, they'll notice something's wrong with you. And as those pile up, well, then the only explanations become blank, alcoholic, blank, other things. And so as I sat thinking, yeah, yeah, it's good not to have that fucking conversation in my head of, do my parents know if I'm on drugs right now? They look like they might know that I'm on drugs. I better go in the bathroom and do another bump. That way they won't know. Yeah, mom, no, I have to pee again. I mean, it's all this eggnog I'm drinking. Where is my eggnog anyway? Oh, I left it in the kitchen? Okay, well, I'll go get that too. Pause. Oh, pause. Okay, I, I'm going dancing, so this is the last of it. But the Biden thing, it's... Ah, oh, fuck, I don't even want to get into it now. No, I want to go dancing first. I'll, I'll see you after dancing. On pause. All right, it's now July 1st. It is 10.38 in the morning, and that makes it a Monday. Uh, and... That makes my birthday, what shall we call it? My birthday breaks down into two very distinct blocks of time, depending on how you want to look at it. There's the six-pack and the fortnight. And both were just top of the line. Absolute, over-achieving all my expectations in every way. I just, I just had a great June. I had a great June. But now it's July, so who who the fuck knows what's next, right? The worst part of June is what we still haven't talked about. Well, now I put you through all that stuff with the academic paradigms and just how <clears throat> entrenched we get to the story when we're involved in the actual creation of that story or if we become a part of the story in such a way that that story becomes our identity. And then instead of looking for truth, we look to protect the story. Yeah. Now, this isn't... Most people, most people actually want to see the truth and then move forward from whatever is learned. But if what you have done is somehow participated in committing to the story, well then, depending on what cracks in that story's veneer start to occur, you are going to be called upon to, at some point or another, stand up for something, pardon me, stand against something you know is wrong by defending something that you have to believe is right for your story to persist. In other words, you're going to start lying at some point. Because humans, we don't have shit figured out, really. That's the point. If we could just be humble enough to understand that we are still toddlers learning the world instead of some sort of masters of the universe... Well, it would be a lot easier to be on this planet, that's for fucking sure. But since humility like that does not come in anything but Donald Trump-sized ego packages, instead, we're locked into this fucking chaos. The chaos that really revealed itself on June 27th when Joe Biden was allowed on stage in what can only be described as a moment of reckoning for the world, but especially for American politics. Pause. Um, pause. Hang on, hang, hang, hang on, buddy. You're saying that all that fucking shit about Egyptology collapsing and hanging on by a fingernail as we account for too much evidence against it for it to stand on its own anymore, like that has anything to do with what's happening in the Democratic Party where we learned Joe Biden's, in fact, too old to be president. That's all we learned on Thursday night, and that's all there is to know about it. You and all your implied deconstruction of the paradigm fucking talk is just horseshit. The reality is, sometimes people get old. Joe Biden got old. Now we know. Now how are we going to deal with it? That's all that there is. Pause. <sighs> Unpause. 
you fucking simpleton. Okay, I agree that we want to look at the main baseline objective reality that exists at all times, and that's the one that truly emerged on Thursday night. Joe Biden is no longer fit for the job. It's clear. While that intuition had been bubbling all over the fucking place, never have we had a more crystal example of clarity than we got Thursday night. That we are, in fact, looking at a man who cannot possibly have the mental capabilities necessary to complete something like four years of presidential obligation to the not just country, but the world. So, why hasn't he stepped down? Okay. If you're going to break it down into the simplest terms, then let's follow them through. If with the world and the reality of American awareness all heightened into the truth that Joe Biden should not be running for, nor in any way given the authority of the office of the President of the United States, well, that demands one question immediately. Why is he still President? Pause. Unpause. And hey, CIA, honestly, I mean, fucking kill Kennedy, the guy with the hopes and dreams of an entire generation in this nation. And then a guy like Biden comes along and I mean, where's the fucking heart attack gun? Jesus Christ. If ever we needed somebody to fucking take one for the team here. Unpause. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to I didn't mean to come to assassination implications as our only solution. But I, I don't know that that's not our only solution. And I, you know how much I have horror violence. I don't I don't have any level of retribution instinct in my head. But I do see that it's not it's not just that Biden's too old for the job, so we'll just get another candidate in there and fix this. And the problem is, the crack in the veneer that was shown on Thursday night isn't as simple as, we've got a man running for president who's unfit for the job. The problem is, we have that situation and we can't stop it. That's what the implication of the last four days have truly proven. Because... In a sane world, Biden never ran for president in the first place. In a sane world, Biden never would be running for president again. In a sane world, all of what ha has happened in American politics can't exist. But in this world, there is so much attachment to power that is beholden to various other attachments to power that if you haven't use that as your leverage point, then you can't ascend to the most enviable positions like president. So the people in these positions are literally figureheads of an entirely powerful network oriented around them. And they're such linchpins in the systems themselves that if they unplug, well, they threaten the entire system coming down. And you can see how now, in, a, in, in an embarrassingly, not just old performance, but feeble and, and disconnected. It, it wasn't just that he seemed like he needed a chair. He seemed like he couldn't keep track of a sentence. And admittedly, I go through that shit all the time on these recordings. But I'm not running for president either. And if you are... If you are in his orbit, you knew this for years. So as the cracks started to appear, you got more defensive. You told us that we were the ones who were misperceiving the strength of a man who, when you see him in the Oval Office giving 12 orders to 12 different people, you can't believe how much he's getting done without evidence, without evidence, without proof. And then you hear about a man who thinks uh, four-day weekends are the new normal and starts taking them three times a month. And you think, yeah, that guy, so efficient, he doesn't even have to work but three days a week. Oh, and he takes six-hour naps on the three days he does work. That guy is fucking on top of his shit. God, I wish I had that kind of time management so I could have six-hour naps three times a week. 
Hmm, how does he sleep that much? How would you even, what would you do? A six hour nap after you just had one? Anyway, my point is, that's the story that starts to be told so that we'll understand that the occasional hubbub about him having admitted last night's dinner with somebody 20 years dead was terrific. Well, he's not senile. He's just got too much history of political service to the people to wade through at any given time to know which little gem nugget of contribution to the better humanity he's going to talk about or some other nonsense blather about why Joe Biden can't keep track of the people in his lives like his son and when he died or when he was a senator versus when he was a vice president or who he's married to. It's just, these are, these are truths that we're unwilling to face. So we allow ourselves to hear the story that the truth we know is there is our own misperception. It's a wicked manipulation against us because we start to doubt that we even know how to re read reality. We'd rather hear someone tell us a story of reality and then thus say, yeah, well, she said it, so that's it. We want to be on a team instead of alone with our thoughts of, is this really all as fucked up as it looks? Oh, no, she says it's okay. Oh, thank you. Finally, somebody with some sense in here, because this is looking kind of fucked up until you told me it was okay. And if you take that all the way to defending those who have gotten into the positions of true leverage against the group's better judgment, well, those who are willing to bend the truth in their favor to maintain those positions are way beyond sociopathic. They are now programmed to do one and one thing only, and that is survive. And survive because the current hierarchy of power structure as it sits is completely in their favor. So survive and thrive is what those who have risen to the top consistently must do. But since doing so means cordoning themselves off from fewer and fewer assets that in their heads are viable or potential threats in the making, well, down to that mm, tiny little center of the sun density group we are, the ones with the real power standing behind the curtain saying, well, if we lose this, we lose everything. So I guess we stand here fighting with everything we've got. And... <clears throat> The thing that they don't have is control over the people. The thing that they most need. And it's finally time, I think, in America for people to understand how much they have been told to think what they think rather than given an opportunity to decide what they think. And <clears throat> this may not even be enough. But everybody online reacting to this story, the Biden re revelation of incompetence that is a media figurehead has taken one of two sides. Either, duh, we knew this, let's move on and get somebody else. Or, uh, Trump told more lies and is more dishonest and a worse person. So even though Biden may be showing some levels of age, he's still the better candidate. I, I shit you not. I shit you not. I shit you not. And if you if you if you can't let go of your moment in the sun because you fear so much what it might be like in the dark, you're just a broken person. Everything that you think you've achieved in this universe, you've taken away from experiences that others have told you, good job, way to go. Instead of realizing that the only way to go that matters is the one that's in your head after you do something where you're like, fuck yeah, way to go. Those matter. And 
you power people, you ones who think Joe Biden is still a viable candidate over there in Washington, you haven't had a personal way to go in, what, decades? Maybe ever? Because all you ever do is look around at what you think will reinforce your life into something of meaning and destiny, and then chase down that goal, only to once again come to the realization that it's a hollow fulfillment, that you don't know who you are, and then unfortunately, you have no idea how to progress forward into a meaningful existence. So, while I get awfully dark with those of you who at some point in life should have looked within so that you could have lit the light that would have led your life somewhere other than to this, well, to all of you, I say stop. Stop the charade. Stop the lies. Stop the, de the complete deception of the public through the media. And just admit we need a better plan going forward in which all of us are involved and see patterns of improvement that are incremental. Or our broken system is going to take down this country and we're all going with it. Joe Biden is the beginning of hopefully the end of all of this chicanery that you've gotten away with. If you unwind it from within, we still have a chance to save the soul of the country. But if you're going to persist and force a Biden-Trump election in November, it'll be the end of America. I'm paused. Okay, no, we, yes, I believe if you force the Trump-Biden election upon the American people, you will see the decline of America in full swing realized, and we will be inevitably headed down into the disintegration of America as it's conceived of in its own borders and around the world. But ending there feels a little, uh, doom and gloomy, so instead... I had the best birthday week of my life. And it was all about getting out in my community and allowing my outreach of generous support, kindness, forgiveness, and understanding and intent to rebound with the upswell of communal integration that led to the best point of where I'm at in life maybe I've ever had. I love my life right now. I love my life right now. And I know there are too few of us here in America that can say that. And I can say that in spite of having the least inspiring leadership I've ever seen. And knowing that I live in a country where the power structure is rotten to the core. But I love my life.